It seems to make sense that improving markers um, of risk factors for heart disease and and you know blood pressure, blood sugar, even body mass index, uh, LDL cholesterol, that improving these should help the outcome, um, the clinical and health outcomes for people with type 2 diabetes. But how much is really a question, right? Because if it takes so much effort to do it and you're barely moving the needle in terms of improvement or outcome, is it worth it? Whereas if it's a very simple intervention and you're making a significant change, okay, that's clearly worth it. And then there's this middle ground, right? Well, a new study is starting to put some numbers to the benefits that we can see by improving these numbers and risk factors uh, for people with type 2 diabetes. So let's get into the study. I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and the study is called Potential Gains in Life Expectancy Associated with Achieving Treatment Goals in U.S. Adults with Type 2 Diabetes. And obviously, this is important because the prevalence and incidence of type 2 diabetes is just keep going up and up and up, which is really unfortunate because it's an absolutely preventable and treatable disease, but yet it's continuing to go up um, in population, which is something we need to address. But what they did for this study, now, for, it was a mathematical model, right? So here's the most important part. It's not like it was a randomized trial or even a prospective trial where they followed people for years to really find out what the life expectancy change was. Instead, it was a mathematical model, which is kind of interesting. I mean, they took, they took data from the ACCORD trial, which is in itself interesting and I'm going to come back to because this was a, a trial that used insulin and sulfonylureas and um, those were like the main therapies for treating um, people, their blood sugar for people with type 2 diabetes, because these are both interventions that raise insulin. So hang on to that. And then it was calibrated to the NHANES data. And they took 421 uh, people from the NHANES, who they said was representative of the um, U.S. adults with type 2 diabetes. So the mean age was 50, uh, 65 years old. Sorry, the mean age was 65 years old. And what they tried to do was say, if you lowered the body mass index, the hemoglobin A1C, the systolic blood pressure, or the LDL based on different quartiles, how much life expectancy did you um, give back to the, to the patient, right? How much did they improve their life expectancy by having these markers improved? And there were some interesting findings. So the first for body mass index, the, compared to the higher quartile at a body mass index of 41, if they had a body mass index of 24.3 on average, that they had a 3.9 years of improved survival. And if the body mass index was 28.6, so overweight but not obese, then uh, it was 2.9 years, and a body mass index of 33 was 2.0 years life saved compared to that of 41. All right, so shows that according to this, body mass index improves. Now, as body mass index improves, other things improve too. It's hard to sort of just isolate body mass index alone, especially if you're improving metabolic health by improving body mass index, but that was that finding. The next most prominent was hemoglobin A1C. So compared to 9.9, .9, which is obviously pretty high, getting down to 7.7 .7 added 3.4 years. Now here's what's interesting. Going below 7.7 .7 didn't add any more, All right? So let me add, say that again. Going below 7.7 .7 didn't, didn't necessarily add more benefit um, compared to 7.7. .7. And this is where it's so important to know where the data came from, right? This is where it's so important to know that the data came from the ACCORD trial, um, which again, didn't show a survival benefit to uh, being aggressive in treating hemoglobin A1C below seven. Why? Well, my hypothesis and a lot of others as well is because it was using insulin and sulfonylureas. So that one increases the risk of hypoglycemia with more aggressive treatment, but two, the more aggressive you're treating it, the higher the insulin level. So it's putting the band-aid on the blood sugar by worsening the hyperinsulinemia um, and the insulin resistance. So you're sort of chasing your own tail. Now, I think that would be completely different with lifestyle interventions that don't raise insulin, but rather lower insulin and still lower hemoglobin A1C, like a low-carb or ketogenic diet, like a lifestyle involving um, you know, exercise and pretty much any sort of weight loss type diet. But I think the evidence is clear. It's most supported for a low-carb or ketogenic diet in that setting. Or maybe by using you know, SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 agonist medicines that don't have the same chronic hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance that insulin and sulfonylurea have. So that could be another finding. But suffice it to say, lowering the hemoglobin A1C, at least to a degree, even with those caveats um, added life years saved. And next was systolic blood pressure compared to 160, lowering it to 114, gave you 1.9 years. 
128 gave you 1.5 years, so not a big difference there, and 139 gave you 1.1 years. And then LDL cholesterol, probably the most controversial, but also you'll see in the study the weakest associated. Compared to 146, lowering it all the way down to 59 gave you 0.9 um, life or 0 0.9 years saved. Um, 84 was 0 0.7, and 107 was 0 0.5. So how do we um, put this all into context? A lot of numbers. I think the key is improving your, your numbers. If you have type 2 diabetes, makes a difference. It's going to help people improve their longevity, right? And most likely their quality of life too, I would argue, as long as the treatment isn't worsening your quality of life. And if we're going to rank them, for this, body mass index was number one and pretty similar to A1C, then systolic blood pressure, and way on the bottom, LDL. So again, not that LDL wasn't important, not that LDL didn't contribute at all, but I think it's it's important to point out that LDL was the lowest because it's sort of what gets the most attention and the most oxygen in the room is LDL, LDL, LDL. And I think we're starting to see more and more information that especially for people with metabolic dysfunction, type two diabetes, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, that, that LDL is definitely not the most important, but yet focusing on the metabolic health is the most important. And this study sort of supports that. That's part of my interpretation of this. Um, the other thing is treatment, type of treatment really, really matters. But here's the biggest assessment I have is that we can prevent all this, right? We don't even need to be having this discussion. It's a lifestyle disease for the majority of people that can be fixed with the right lifestyle. Now, with the right lifestyle, right? I think it's pretty clear, eat less, move more, lower your fat, count your calories. That just that advice just doesn't work and hasn't been working and is not the patient's fault. It's not your fault, it's not working. It's bad advice. If you could follow that, if everybody could easily follow that, all right, it would probably work. But I think the key is that people can't follow it, right? It is more difficult to follow that than to follow a diet where you're eating foods you enjoy. You're not counting calories. You're feeling naturally satiated and full so you don't have to keep eating. You're getting all your nutrition and you're doing it in a way that helps you lose fat mass while maintaining muscle mass and lowering your insulin so you don't have the chronic hyperinsulinemia that we see with, with some of these treatments. So that's another big caveat. And that's what I, I just, I want every opportunity to bring attention to that, that that is the way I think we all should be treating type 2 diabetes. Verta Health has shown this with their trial using a ketogenic diet. A number of trials using low carb and keto diets have shown this. And also high protein diets by themselves have shown this, even without being ketogenic, that they can um, treat blood sugar very well. And I think that's a big part of this, you know, feeling full without hunger is such a important lifestyle behavior change um, that's going to help you be compliant long term and be successful long term. So anyway, that's my two cents on this. Hopefully this was helpful so that you can see um, intervening and improving risk factors um, for people with type 2 diabetes makes a difference and we can do it. And uh, if you want more information about it, please go to dietdoctor.com where you have lots of information, recipes, meal plans um, to help you get started today. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you here next time on Diet Doctor News on YouTube.